Good morning. I'm a resident in respiratory medicine, and I work at Centro Clinico Nemo uh, here in Milan, a small multidisciplinary center uh, specific uh, dedicated to neuromuscular diseases. Um, I will present you preliminary data of our retrospective study about the management of chronic respiratory failure in ALS patients with non-invasive ventilation from onset of the disease till exitus or tracheostomy. Our primary aims were to describe non-invasive ventilation course in ALS patients attending our center, comparing survival differences in relation to different onset, and try to outline the relationship between pulmonary function and NIV parameters, and also try to find a possible relationship between the evolution of the disability measured by ALS FRS revised care, pulmonary function, and characteristic of non-invasive ventilation. I want to focus today on bulbar patients. In literature, bulbar ALS patients have worse NIV tolerance and survival. Uh, even if there are many works about this topic, uh, there is no clear consensus uh, on NIV parameters to be used to maximize efficacy and tolerance in ALS patients. Uh, our population um, is composed by ALS patients attended our center between 2008 and 2011. Uh, we have included all the patients who have concluded non-invasive ventilation course at our center uh, from baseline respiratory evaluation, um, passing through the necessity of NIV and the use of non-invasive non ventilation till tracheostomy or exitus. Uh, of a total of uh, 535 patients, uh, 147 were eligible for, for this study, and we have uh, randomly uh, choose 78 uh, patients. For every patient, we have uh, collected uh, demographic data, and we have divided the respiratory story of every patient in six phases. The first of spontaneous breathing, then the necessity of non-invasive ventilation, the third, the first control after the adaptation to non-invasive ventilation with a nocturnal use only, mm, a use of non-invasive ventilation between 10 to 16 hours, then more than 16 hours, and the last one uh, with exitus or tracheostomy. For every respiratory phase, we collected nocturnal pulse oximetry, arterial blood gas analysis, orthostatic and clinostatic spirometry, NIV parameters, and total bulbar and respiratory ALS FRS revived score. Uh, these are the demographic data of our sample. We have found that uh, the percentages of every um, clinical setting, clinical onset of our patient, not only uh, are in line with literature, but also represent uh, all uh, the entire NEMO population. We have calculated the time in months between onset of the disease and the diagnosis, and is uh, about 11 months, 10.69 uh, months. And we have also calculated the delay between diagnosis and the first respiratory assessment, um, that is 10.88 months. I think this is really a very, very long period. Um, this is the respiratory situation of our patient at baseline, at the first evaluation. I want to make you notice just the time spent under 90% of uh, oxygen saturation during the night, that is about 11% uh, in uh, every subgroup, and above all, forced vital capacity measured in <clears throat> an orthostatic position that is lower than 80% than in every subgroup. And this FUC mm, declines in clinostatic position. And in bulbar patients, we have um, the greatest difference between the, the, FUC, 
FVC measured in autostatic and clinostatic position. Um, um, another interesting data that is uh, clinically significant but not statistically significant is peak cough, uh, peak of cough. Uh, normal value of peak of cough is 270 liters for minutes. In our bubble patient, already at the first evaluation, we have an impairment in the efficacy of cough. Why do we measure FVC in clinostatic position? Uh, some papers, as the one mentioned here from CHEST, uh, stated that FUC measured in supine position had the highest correlation with the transdiaphragmatic pressure. Um, and if the FUC is lower than 74%, reaches 100% specificity and sensitivity in predicted uh, diaphragmatic weakness. At the first evaluation, we can say that the most part of our patients have a diaphragmatic weakness already at the first evaluation. ALS FRS revised scale is a measure of a global function. Um, at baseline, our patient, uh, none of um, our subgroup of patients reach the, integ the functional integrity um, of the scale. And also, every patient, not only the bulbar one, uh, have a bulbar impairment. And the bulbar imp impairment is very important in bulbar subgroup, and, is, uh, and this is st statistically significant. Um, we have um, tried to find some correlation between the score of uh, ALS FRS scale and uh, um, respiratory parameters. And we have found that total ALS FRS score uh, have a, has a direct correlation with force vital capacity in autostatic position, medium SpO2 during the night, and the share of oxygen in arterial blood gas analysis, and has an inverse correlation with the time spent under 90% of oxygen saturation during the night. Uh, an important, important correlation uh, we have found uh, with uh, uh, between bulbar uh, score of ALS FRS scale and uh, um, other um, respiratory parameters. Um, we have a direct correlation with both uh, FUC measured in autostatic and clinostatic position and also the peak of cough and an inverse correlation with the ratio um, between autostatic and clinostatic force vital, uh, vital capacity. Uh, when we have to adapt um, a patient to non-invasive ventilation, we use international guidelines and criteria. Um, the aims of non-invasive ventilation uh, are to reduce the saturation index, improve um, oxygen saturation during the night, trying to stabilize uh, tidal volumes, uh, and try to improve tolerance, maximizing um, NIV outcomes in every kind of um, phenotypes. We use B-level and pressovolumetry device in pressometric modes. Um, during the adaptation, uh, we use a pressure support of about 10 centimeters of water, and we set a PEEP, that is a, a positive and expiratory pressure uh, of more than five centimeters of water. Uh, many, author, uh, many authors um, don't set PEEP uh, during the adaptation of non-invasive ventilation, but we have found that um, not only during the adaptation, but also um, with the progression of the disease, uh, every patient uh, presents a, a bulbar impairment, impairment, and that, cause, that causes um, obstructive apnea. So it's important to set a PEEP um, to stabilize upper uh, airways. Um, 
uh, we know absolutely that um, nocturnal pulse oximetry and sometimes polygraphy in case of uh, obstructive apnea is absolutely important, not only during the adaptation to non-invasive ventilation, but also in respiratory follow-up. Um, in literature, the bubble form is characterized by a worse prognosis and a lower tolerance to non-invasive ventilation, but in our sample, we have found that bulbar patient has the same survival uh, as the other um, subgroup of patients. We know that Clinostatic spirometry should be included in international guidelines for the evaluation of diaphragmatic impairment. EPUB or PEEP sets higher than four centimeters of water, reduce oxygen desaturation index, normalize target um, tidal volume, and increase SpO2 in NIV, and permits better tolerance and adherence in all patients. This allows bulb patients to have a duration of disease comparable to other onsets. Nocturnal pulse oximetry and sometimes polygraphy is absolutely essential to optimize parameters and reduce oxygen desaturation index in respiratory follow-up. And the functional rate scale as a measurement of disability seems to have more implications in the quantification of respiratory impairment. The smallest is the score at ALS FRS revised care. The higher is the probability to have a respiratory failure. Thank you. It caught me by surprise. Uh, any questions for Eliza? Hello, I'm Julie Draper. I'm a trustee of the MNDA um, in the UK. Um, I'm just thinking about posture in people with bulbar, um, and actually any kind of ALS, because I just remember um, a friend of mine dying in the I think probably just because his, he obstructed himself. And what do you think about that? Could you um, explain? You un understand. Well, it's just that um, there are other things, I think, as well as um, improving what you have been suggesting. And despite, and I think the patient I'm thinking about actually had pretty good um, uh, levels. But actually, in the car, he obstructed, I think he, he died in the car, sitting up, and I think he probably obstructed himself. And I think one or two of the messages um, to patients, that is really vital. I think that uh, we know that non-invasive ventilation is important, but also there are many other things um, to, um, many other important things for these patients. And one of these are, um, uh, many kind of device to to have a good position and uh, to um, to to stay in a, in a correct uh, way no, yes this is the ventilation is important but not not only and uh, I know uh, this this is a, a great problem but um, and, and I think this is uh, the importance of a complete um, assessment at um, for, for a complete evaluation of the patient, I think. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, I just want, uh, Kelly Saunders from England. I just wanted to um, clarify something. You said EPA needs to be set above four. Yes. Um, is that just in bulbar patients or was that across the board for all patients on NIV that you did that for? Mm. 
all patients. Okay. Uh, we sat during the adaptation, we sat people, um, in every case, more than four, or always four, just four centimeters of water. Because we have, uh, we have found that um, during the, not only during the adaptation, but also during the progression of disease, uh, um, there are many obstructive uh, apneas, and so we have to stabilize the upper airways. And these uh, just four, a minimum, a minimum of four centimeters of water uh, stabilize the upper um, airways and uh, uh, maximize the efficacy of non-invasive ventilation and also the tolerance for the patient. Is there another question? No? Join with me in thanking uh, Eliza for her presentation.